Good day, Math 30-1s. Today we continue with a conversation after the remainder theorem about something called the factor theorem. Our goal today is to use the remainder theorem and extend it into factoring polynomials up to degree 5. So ultimately we're going to factor anything up to degree 5. As a quick investigate to get us thinking about the remainder theorem and the factor theorem and what we know is that if you were asked to get the remainder for these two different examples, we can approach them in two different ways. A reminder that last day we learned how to do synthetic division, which examines the coefficients in descending order, dividing by x plus 1, dropping down the 1, 1 times 1, subtract, multiply, subtract for a zero remainder, giving us this x plus 1 divisor next to an x minus 5. So what we actually did, if we recreate that division statement, is we factored. Because there's a zero remainder, this means we don't have to put a plus zero, and this tells us a lot about this polynomial. We know it's x-intercepts, and we know roughly what this looks like, and again, that's because we didn't have a remainder because it was zero. For letter A, we can approach this without having to do synthetic division, which can be a bit time consuming, by evaluating the quadratic, by evaluating the polynomial at x equals 3. Now this is much more efficient than synthetic division, but as a zero remainder, we end up with, again, a nice statement that we've got some product with a zero remainder, and in fact, we could have approached these questions a little bit more quickly had we recognized that they, that they were factorable. But again, not every question is factorable. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the special case where there isn't a remainder and where we're looking for factors. There is a bit of a relationship between the remainder and um, the factors of a polynomial, and I'm going to mention this a few times today, that um, the remainder needs to be zero to have perfect factors. And basically this just means that it is really, really nice if you have a zero remainder. Now the factor theorem states that if you have x minus a as a factor, so you're dividing by x minus a, it's a factor of a polynomial if when you plug in a, zero comes out, if the remainder is zero. So if you, again, divide by x plus 1 and zero comes out, it means you have factors. That's basically it. It's factorable. So in other words, it is great when the remainder is zero because then we're dealing with perfect factors like we mentioned a few times already. Let's start to examine this in the context of a few examples where um, we've got a polynomial x cubed minus x squared minus 5x plus 2. If it were written in factored form, would x minus 1 be a factor? So does this factor with an x minus 1? How do we know? Well, if it was factorable, the remainder should be 0? Question mark. Well, let's plug in x equals 1, which is essentially doing the remainder theorem to see what the remainder is. If the remainder is 0, we're essentially saying through the factor theorem that it is a factor. So the remainder theorem and the factor theorem are very tightly connected. 1 minus 1 minus 5 plus 2, we have a remainder of negative 3. Is x minus 1 a factor? No. The remainder needs to be 0. So in fact, um, we might have to try a different binomial. We might have to try some, um, some more synthetic division. Or maybe it's not even factorable. Let's move on and, and see a few more different styles and keep building up uh, some strategies in the factor theorem. Uh, if you are told here are three x-intercepts, x-intercepts occur when y is 0, namely when the remainder is 0. So if you're told these are the x-intercepts for a function, we could have din done this historically and said x plus 2 is a factor, x x plus 2 is a factor, 
x minus 2 is a factor, and x minus 1 is a factor. And there might be a vertical stretch on this. There might be some sort of um, some a value in front. But this is a polynomial in factored form with those x-intercepts. Now, the second part of this is to show using the factor theorem that one of the indicated intercepts is, in fact, a root. So let's just pick uh, arbitrarily um, x equals 1, because it's a nice number. So we're trying to show that if you plug in a 1, that 0 comes out. And so you have a 1 plus a 2, a 1 minus a 2, and a 1 minus a 1. That 0 wipes this whole thing out, and a 0 would come out. And this is where, in a factored form, you can see how each of the x-intercepts produces a 0 output. Because if you put a 2 in the middle binomial, you get a 0 factor. If you put a negative 2 in the first term, the whole thing becomes a 0 because this is a 0. So those three x-intercepts are the only magical numbers that will wipe the whole thing out and create a 0. And that's creating your x-intercept, your y-value of 0, your remainder of 0. So I've been talking very conveniently about giving you factors, giving you x-intercepts, but ultimately we won't always be told one of the factors or one of the x-intercepts. And under the heading of finding a perfect factor, um, how do we do that becomes our next goal. And we do need to think very logically. There is a connection between the factors and a very specific term in the polynomial. Namely, this last value in a quadratic is created from a negative 3 times a 2. That 12 is created from a 3 and a 4. The 18 is created from a 9 and a 2. Those are very, very important um, locations as we maybe start to say, what could the factors be? And we're going to start with that constant term to figure out some potential factors. So if you were to try to figure out possible zeros or roots or x-intercepts, what might you try? Well, I would look at this and, and I would know that in the binomials, the last numbers are either going to be a 6 and a 1 or a 3 and a 2, positive or negative, of course. But I might be saying, well, maybe it's going to be a 2, maybe it's going to be a 3, Maybe it's a 1, maybe it's a 6, maybe one of those, and a positive or negative version of all of those. So I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a 1, 2, 3, 6, positive or negative. So the idea here is that we're going to be looking at factors of the constant term, factors of the constant term to test with the remainder theorem for possible roots. This is called the integral zero theorem, which really is just saying test factors of the constant term for the remainder to be zero. And if we get the remainder to be zero, awesome, then we've got factors. So let's try this in practice. And in example three, what we've got is a cubic function, and it basically says determine a factor. And you might be thinking, well, how do I know what binomial to work with? So what we're hoping to be uh, seeing is that this factor, this constant term, should be helping to produce one of the three factors. So what we get to do is to examine factors of that constant term. And really only the only numbers that create a 3 is a 1 and a 3. We are going to need to examine the positive and negative version of each because a negative times a negative at some point might create the positive. So let's test one of these. and. Sometimes it'll be a very, very great first guess, sometimes it won't be, but we have four potential numbers to test for the remainder to be zero. So I sometimes will just try one and cross my fingers hoping for a zero to come out, because one's a pretty easy number to plug in. What we have is a one cubed minus a three times a one squared minus a one plus a three. Fingers crossed. One minus three minus one plus three those are all sort of opposites of each other, positives and negatives, and they do in fact cancel out. So if I plug in a 1, a 0 comes out. I'm going to say that's a win, that's a check mark, because what we just discovered is that when x equals 1, or when our binomial is x minus 1, 
we have a factor. And that is the very, very first step of factoring without being told one of your, um, one of your three factors. So this is the strategy that we're going to employ as we go forward. Let's move on to example four and see if we can actually completely and fully factor a polynomial. So what we do is we find a perfect factor. So we look at the, um, we look at the constant term and consider some possible numbers to factor. So might be a positive or negative one, again, might be a positive or negative three. Arbitrarily, let's just again try one, see what happens. We have two times one cubed, minus five times one squared, minus four times one, plus a three. Fingers crossed again, two minus five minus four plus three. I'm seeing a two and a three, that's a positive five. Positive five and a negative five wipes out, so we're left with a negative four. Oh, that's no good. So I know that x equals one is not gonna help us out. Let's try another one. Um, I'll stick with the positive numbers for a moment and try a three. 2 times a 3 cubed, minus a 5 times a 3 squared, minus a 4 times a 3, plus a 3. We end up with a 2 times a 27, 5 times a 9, minus a 12, plus a 3. What we have is a 54, minus a 45 is a 9, 9 minus 12 is a negative 3, a negative 3 and a positive 3 is in fact a 3. Perfect. So we know that x equals three works, which means, and I'll always write this, x minus three is a factor. Perfect. Now we don't have to keep testing until we get more factors. You can actually have fractional or rational zeros as well. So we're not gonna start testing um, one half and um, three halves and, and fractions but those might be possible. So we're only going to be focusing in this course on whole numbers or integers. So synthetic division, let's do this. We're going to take our original polynomial 2x cubed minus 5x squared minus 4 plus 3 and divide it by x minus 3. 2 drops down, multiply negative 6, subtract, multiply, subtract, multiply, Zero remainder, we already knew that, but this confirms it. So we get an x minus three times a two x squared plus an x minus a one plus zero remainder, perfect. And the hope is that this factors one step further, and in fact it does. So the last step after this is to factor the quotient until there's nothing left to factor. And so I factor this by te um, looking at te factors of the first term, factors of the last term, and they diagonally check out 2x and negative x adds up to a positive x, which is your middle term, so we have our factors. x minus 3, 2x minus 1, x plus 1, and for the very first time we factored a cubic function from start to finish without being told one of the factors. That is essentially it. So we'll look at maybe one more example. We can maybe skip the top one. If you wanted to try it, you definitely could. It asks to determine the possible dimensions of a rectangular prism or a box with that volume. So your task would be to find uh, one factor by testing positive negative one, positive negative two, positive negative four, positive negative five, 10, 20, lots of possibilities, hoping for a good one. Now, if you wanted to pause the video, I'll write the answer, but this is one that you can try if you like. Your factors would end up being an x minus one, an x plus a 10, and an x minus a two. But again, worth trying. I have one more to try after this, and I wanted to skip the previous one and do one a little bit more intense. This is a fourth degree quartic function. So for this one, um, again, it's worth trying yourself, and it's actually a little bit more interesting when you realize um, there's a second big step in here. But we're again looking at factors to test. Positive negative one, positive negative two, three, four, 
6, 8, 12, and a 24. Only one of these matters right now. So if we were to keep trying, one of these would eventually work if this does factor, and it'll actually give us one. If you do plug in a 2, a 0 does work. Therefore, x minus 2 is a factor. So after we get one of the factors, we would then go into synthetic division and say, all right, x minus 2, we'd write down our coefficients 1, negative 5, 2, 20, negative 24, and we would start our cycle. 1 drops down, multiply, subtract, multiply, subtract, multiply, subtract, multiply, zero remainder. And we end up with, and you should always do this as well, don't forget that number in front helps recreate your division statement. An x minus 2 times, again, it was a degree 4, now we're at a degree of 3. x cubed minus 3x squared minus a 4x plus a 12. The next step after this was supposed to be factor the quotient. And you're thinking, how am I supposed to factor a cubic? And then you pause and realize it's another synthetic division, another factor theorem. Test factors of 12. Positive negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12. Lots of options. Again, I'll give us one that does work. So if you, in fact, use x equals 2, again, you get a 0 that comes out. So in fact, x minus 2 is another factor. There's actually two x minus 2 factors. So we get to go ahead and do another synthetic division, just leaving out that x minus 2 in front for a moment and say, let's divide this again. 1x cubed minus 3x squared minus 4x plus a 12, dividing by another x minus 2. And repeat another cycle. Multiply, subtract, multiply, subtract, multiply, zero remainder, which is what we expected. So we have 2x minus 2s. We have an x squared minus x minus 6. Again, plus zero remainder. This last one does factor nicely, and if you did get good at factoring quadratics last year, you might just see it before you actually get too worried. An x minus 3 and an x plus 2. Four factors recreating your degree of 4. This is factoring for the first time a quartic function, and you're expected to be able to get up to a quintic function, degree 5 if needed. You might write this as an x minus 2 squared if you want, you may have been thinking that, but ultimately one of these is a great final answer. Make sure you get some practice with synthetic division. Make sure you understand that the factor theorem is asking us to, text, to test factors of the constant term for the remainder to be zero, and ultimately we're hoping for that remainder to be zero, because after this, hopefully we can start to graph.